I'm a 24 year old male and this happened to me a few years ago when I was around 21. I remember because it was shortly after my birthday in December. It was really cold outside and there was snow on the ground as we had just had a snowstorm pass through our area. I lived with my parents at the time and my mom is not really a fan of driving in the snow so she asked me if I could drive her to the gas station for her to pick up some cigarettes for her and my dad as well as a few other items they might have needed. I said sure as I wasn't really doing anything at the time and I grabbed my keys then following her to the car. I remember the cold air hitting your face pretty hard that night so it had to be at least around the teens which made the snow and whatever else was on the roads really slippery. This is important to know for later on in the story. The nearest gas station was about 5 minutes away from us, but given the conditions of the roads, it took us about 10 to get there. Once I was able to park the car, my mom got out of the car, then made her way inside the store. From where I was parked, I could see her inside the store, standing in the line that was leading up to the register. I kept the car running as it was really cold and I just didn't want to be sitting in the car without any heat. I was browsing on my phone while waiting for my mom to get done, and right around that time I had seen her finally approach the register. There was a black truck that pulled up into the parking spot right next to my car. I found this a bit unusual given that the parking lot was empty, so I mean there was really no reason for them to park right next to the spot where I was. But I kinda just chalked it up to them wanting to be as close to the entrance as they could given how cold it was that night. No one got out of the car at first, but I didn't even notice this until I looked up to see my mom walking out of the entrance back to the car. I glanced over to the truck's passenger side window, and I could just make out a figure sitting in the passenger seat, and they were facing in my direction. My mom opened the door, then got inside, before then asking me what I was looking at. I told her about the truck pulling up well over a few minutes ago, around the same time that she approached the register, but that nobody had gotten out. She first chalked it up to maybe they were just waiting for someone inside the store to come out. But when I mentioned seeing a figure in the passenger side of the car looking towards our direction, she then began to sense why I was so spooked out by it. She told me to just back out and get out of there and that we didn't need to worry about them once we drove off. As soon as I put the car into reverse and then began to back up, the passenger door swung open and hit the side of my car. A tall, very built man stepped out from the car as soon as the door made contact with my car. I hit the brakes as soon as I felt the contact and the man stood there before throwing his hands up at me and then staring in my direction. I didn't really know what to do as I'd never really been in any sort of accident before and my mom was sitting right there next to me and could see as well as I had that the door had not been opened until we had already started moving. The man slowly walked up to my window and just stood there. I cracked it very slowly and I told the man that I was sorry but that I didn't see the door open as I was backing out. For a brief moment he didn't really say anything, that is before he simply asked, Roll down your window a little bit more, I can barely hear you. I knew this couldn't be true as it was really quiet in that area and I wasn't even speaking in a low tone. I told him that I'd prefer to keep it cracked as I really didn't want to let cold air get into the car. This really angered the man and he immediately spoke in a more angered tone now. He was telling me to roll down my window yet again. I again told him no and this is when things then took a turn for the absolute worse. Without any warning whatsoever, the man smacked my window really hard with his hand. Startled, I immediately jumped back and rolled the window up. My mom was right beside me just absolutely yelling for me to just back out and leave but I was really afraid of hitting the man in the process as he was still right next to my car. The man kept smacking my window really hard a few more times before he then tried punching it. It was right at this point where I realized that if I didn't get my mom and I out of there fast, this guy was definitely gonna hurt us. I could see the cashier inside the gas station heard what was going on and he looked to be on the phone with what I could only assume was the police. But there was absolutely no way I could wait for them as the man was now both punching at my window and now kicking my door. It was like some switch had then flipped on in this man's head and he had just totally lost it. I told my mom to hold on as I put the car into reverse again and backed out of there as fast as I could, just barely missing the guy by a few inches. 
I pulled fully out of the parking spot before the man ran out in front of our car and slammed his hands right on the hood. I sat there frozen, not knowing what to do, as the man looked right back at me. I turned the car wheel and sped around him, trying to avoid him the best that I could before booking it the hell out of there. After that, I honestly thought that was the end of it. But as we made our way down the road to a stoplight, I was able to see headlights that was fast approaching from behind our car. And once it was close enough behind us, I could then see that it was the same truck the man was in. There appeared to be two people inside of it. I assumed the man I encountered must have been the passenger, and I guess the driver was someone I hadn't noticed before. I told my mom that it was them behind us and she started to freak out and call my dad, then letting him know what was going on. We were still probably about 10 minutes away from our house given the road conditions, but I knew that there was no way that I could get us back to our house in that amount of time before these guys tried to ram us off the road or whatever else they had planned for us. My dad told my mom for us to attempt to head back towards our house and that he would try and meet us halfway in his truck. She told me this and I agreed that this had to be our best option given that I couldn't turn around and head back to the gas station still not knowing if the police had even been called or not. So once the light turned green, I punched on the gas and sped off. I'm going to be completely honest. I really wasn't being that cautious of the road at this point as there really weren't any other cars at this point of the night. There were a few times where the car slid from the ice on the road, and I knew that it would only take one turn of the wheel to lose control, but I wasn't going to slow down and let these guys catch up to us. After about a few minutes of driving, we were able to see headlights right in front of us on the other side of the road. I was thinking that it had to be my father, and as we got a little closer, we were able to make out his truck beyond the lights. Very surprisingly, the truck was still behind us, still keeping pace with me given the road conditions. I could see my father cut across a midsection of the roads and then stop shortly off the side of the road. I started to slow down right as we approached and then pulled off to the side of the road, the truck still following me. As I came to a stop, the same man from before that was in the passenger seat hopped out of the car then started making his way to our car. The driver opened his door but before he could step out, both of the men stopped dead in their tracks at the sound of my father's voice. I suggest the both of you hop back in that car and drive right on out of here before I put a bullet in the both of you. I could see my dad walking out into the light radiating from both his and my headlights. He had his 9mm pistol pulled and named right at the man's head as he stood right next to my car. I pretty much just watched as both of the men just stood there for a brief moment as my dad slowly inched his way towards them. The man then very slowly backed away towards his truck before then speaking to what I assumed was my father. You're really lucky you got here when you did. The man laughed and jumped back into his truck before it quickly backed out and drove off in the other direction. My dad walked to my window and he asked me and my mom if we were okay. I remember telling him that other than being scared shitless, I think we were fine. Shortly afterwards, my dad followed us back home just to make sure no one else followed us. I really have no idea what those men's intentions were or why the man acted the way he did. All I know is that if I hadn't reacted how I did to get my mom and I out of there, I just really hate to think what those men would have done to us. This story happened to me a month ago. I used to talk with one of my friends before going to sleep. So that day we talked as usual and went to sleep. The next day when I woke up, I got a call from her and she told me about last night. Hey, why did you call me last night at 5 a.m.? As soon as I heard her words, I felt really weird since I was sleeping at that time, of course. I definitely remember that I didn't call or talk to anybody. What are you talking about? I was asleep. No, I swear to God, you literally called me and the voice was exactly the same as yours. She then said that she felt that the call was so weird, so she ended up hanging the call. As soon as she told me, I heard a sudden voice coming from the bathroom. Hey, I gotta go. When I hung up the call, then went to check the bathroom, I found the door was open, which was strange because I remember that it was closed when my friend just had called me. 
I looked inside but there was no one there. So I closed the door and walked a few steps just until I heard the door behind me open again. I slowly turned around and went to close the door, but this time I went inside to check that no one is there. At that very moment, I could feel a cold breath on my neck. Being freaked out, I got out of the bathroom and went back to my room. While I was sitting on my bed trying to calm down, I heard someone whispering in my ear, Veronica. That name, I immediately remembered it. That name was spelled by the Ouija board last night, which I was playing with my friend talking on the phone. I asked if there was someone with me, and the board answered yes. Her name was Veronica. So she was the one that talked with my friend last night. This post is actually what I wrote on the internet website anonymously. Hello, I have something to ask y'all. Let's get to the point. There is a strange smell like a fishy smell of water in my house somewhere. For your information, we don't have any fish tanks in our house. And we don't even raise fish. I can't exactly define that it's a real fishy smell of water, actually. But it smells that bad. It doesn't smell anywhere else. But particularly bad in the main room. The house where I live is newly remodeled. We had moved here and lived for about seven months now. Since we moved here and lived for about seven months now, there was nothing wrong with it at first. The weird thing is, it doesn't smell always like that. But I don't think I can live here anymore because of this disgusting stench. This is the first time I've ever smelled this awful smell at home. My family tried to find the source of the smell, but we have no idea what it is. At first, I thought it was coming from the curtains. When I sniffed on the curtain, I could smell something similar near the curtain. However, when I smelled it again a few days later, the stench was gone. And just yesterday, now my bed's mattress cover suddenly started smelling. I bought this around fall and washed it very often. I don't know what happened to this. I really don't know what the cause is since I don't have anything that smells bad in my house, like foods or something. Now, I'm so freaked out. Could the house itself smell like this? If anyone knows the reason, please let me know. Thank you. A few days later, I read a few comments posted on the website. Comment number one. Well, you should ask a control office. Comment number two. It sounds like mold. Look carefully. The window where the curtain was attached might smell. Comment number three. Congratulations, you've moved out. As you know, some movies go like this. When the dead body is hidden in the wall, it does smell. I go to uni here in Leicester in the UK, and like most students, I'm out clubbing every weekend that I can afford it. I've had some of the best nights of my life with the girls in Leicester City Centre, but I'm not going to lie. I've seen some really horrid things too. From girls weeing themselves while they're too drunk to stand, to bar fights where rabid lads were whipping bottles at each other. I think alcohol has the ability to bring out the absolute worst in people. And it was on a night out in Leicester that one of the scariest things I'd ever been part of or witnessed to happened right in front of me. So we're leaving a club one Saturday night, planning on stumbling over the road to the kebab house to get ourselves some cheesy chips when we see this girl sitting outside the club, looking absolutely rotten drunk. The poor thing can barely keep her eyes open and it doesn't look like anyone there is looking after her, which was honestly a little bit concerning. But the kebab place we ended up sitting down in had these big glass windows that looked out into the street, so from my window seat I could still keep my eyes on her. I got my cheesy chips and I'm sitting there eating them when I see this lad walk up to her who takes her by the hand and then starts trying to get her to stand up. I was really relieved at first because I thought her boyfriend had showed up to take her home, but the longer I looked, the more I just got this bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. Not only was this girl just refusing to go with this guy when she had every reason to want to get home and out of the cold, but the guy was like looking over her shoulder and looking around like he didn't want people to see what he was doing. You know, making sure the coast was clear or something. 
It was such an obvious sign of guilt and I could just tell that something wasn't quite right. Eventually the guy just pulls the girl up to her feet while she weakly struggles and fails to shake him off. Then he starts dragging her away from the club and into the middle of the street. I start alerting my mates to this and immediately we all get up from the table we're at, grabbing our boxes of chips and heading out into the street to confront the guy. We rush over, intending to give it our best British passive-aggressive, uh, excuse me, do you know her? When out of like nowhere, this car rushes up and breaks violently next to the pair of them. But in doing so, one of the front wheels like runs over the girl's foot and she lets out this kind of dull wail of pain. Then as the guy drags her around the side of the car that we're approaching, we see her foot like flopping around in this really unnatural way where her ankle is really obviously broken. The guy then starts to basically bundle the girl into the back of the seat that had at least three other guys in it, and we only just catch him in time to try to stop it. We're asking if he knows her and asking if the girl if she's alright, insisting he needs to call an ambulance for her right that instant. He starts trying to tell us that everything's okay and that he knows her, and he's going to take her to an accident emergency to have her foot looked at. One of my mates asks him what her name is, and he sort of freezes, hesitates, and pulls some random name out of his butt in a way that made it painfully obvious that he didn't know her before he walked up to her just a few minutes before. We start going mad, like telling him we're going to call the police if he doesn't let her go, and this gets the other lads in the car really agitated, who start barking at him to get the girl in the car, which he does almost violently before the car starts to drive away. I'm trying to get the car's number plate while one of my mates is on the phone to the police, but I can't make it out properly. So for one horrible moment, I thought that was it, that something terrible was going to happen to that girl and we totally just failed to stop it. But I turn around, and my other two friends are piling into a hackney cab screaming, Get in, Chloe. Then what followed was legit like a movie. My mate is all like, follow that car, and then we're off. Whizzing around Leicester City Center, following this black Volvo with the lads and the injured girl inside. As we're following it, it's just chaos in the back of the cab. One of my mates is still on the phone to the police telling them what's going on. Another one of my mates is giving the cab driver the lowdown on the situation, all the while I'm noting the fact that the lads don't seem to be driving anywhere near the local A&E. They're actually headed out of the city center towards the suburbs, which, to me, was a pretty good indicator that we're trying to take her somewhere dark and secluded to do only God knows what to her. My maid got off the phone with the police and told us that they told her that they had a unit in the area and they weren't messing about either. It was like a minute or two before we saw blue flashing lights and the cab driver pulled his cab back away from the Volvo to let the police slip in to pull them over. When they finally do pull over, we all pile out of the cab while the driver waits for us, watching what was going on and shouting over and over, liar, liar, when the guy starts telling the policeman that the girl is their friend and that they're taking her home. The other policeman who was there then comes over to us and starts getting our side of the story, which basically involved me telling him everything I'd seen and how I said it was incredibly suspicious. What happened next all unfolded over the course of like an hour, with more police cars turning up to keep an eye on the lads while one set of policemen got the girl out of the car and drove her to the hospital. I'm not sure if the lads got arrested or not, but I know they got their details taken down and no matter what happened after that, I know the girl ended up being taken away from the obvious danger and getting her foot seen to. My only real concern then was that the cab driver was going to charge us like an arm and a leg for keeping him occupied for so long, but he actually refused to take any money off of us and in the end, saying it was just nice to see some people doing some good in the world, and that when his daughter is our age and gets into any trouble, that he'd hope there'd be some good Samaritans like us to help her out. I always see 44 minutes. Hello, I'm posting this on the website because I have a question. Every time I look at the time, I always see 44 minutes. I mean a number, 4-4. Four, four. Those five years of marriage with my husband was the beginning of this phenomenon. I've been going through a hard time because of his bad habit that he drinks almost every day. 
and we've been living a dry life with each other, sleeping in separate bedrooms, without any marital relations. My life was not happy, and I couldn't stand it anymore. So I ended up leaving home one day, carrying my four-year-old baby on my back. I demanded a divorce, but my husband didn't agree. While living apart from him, I started to meet someone for a while, and that's when all the things started. He often said that he sees 44 minutes whenever he had his eye on the clock. And one day I started to experience the exact same thing with him. After divorcing my husband, I broke up with the guy I met later, since I couldn't get along well with him either. However, I've been watching the same time, 44 minutes since then. For example, it would be 10.44 p.m. when I turned on my cell phone all of a sudden and it would be precisely 4.44 a.m. when I checked the time by myself at dawn. Another day I heard a hallucination that sounded like my phone bell ringing, so I checked my cell phone and it was exactly 44 minutes. It's been more than two years since living like this. Meanwhile, I heard that my ex-husband had passed away lately due to a cerebral hemorrhage caused by excessive drinking. I was very sorry for him and suddenly wondered whether the 44 minutes had been predicting all these things. If I knew he'd leave like that, I'd try to get along with him one more time. I couldn't breathe with regret and apology when I thought about him who had a hard time alone. Anyway, I thought everything settled down like that. However, I still see 44 minutes to this day. Like most of the Asian countries, the number four is often recognized as an unlucky number. I'm frightened, and I'm sick of those numbers, 44 minutes. What does that mean? Please let me know. Please help me. Regarding I always see 44 minutes. You see, 44 minutes is just one of the 24 hours. One minute, 13 minutes, and 44 minutes are all just one number in 60 minutes. I know number four is given a special meaning, but time is just time. For example, if I see seven minutes every time when I look at my watch, I guess I'm going to think that it's just one of the numbers in 60 minutes. It's not a symbol of luck or anything else. Not a big deal. Just do not pay too much attention and try to use it in real life. Let's say you are cooking noodles at 41 minutes, and you think it'll be 44 minutes at some point, right? Then you can stop making noodles and eat them right away. And there's another case. Let's suppose that it's about 8.04 p.m. now. If the drama starts in 40 minutes, then turning on the TV thinking like this, oh, it must be 44 minutes exactly. I'm so sorry that your ex-husband died, but I think it's a natural result of his frequent drinking. First of all, thank you for your answer. By the way, the answer adoption rate is 44.4%. It's really weird, isn't it? In December of 2006, I was 15 years old at the time. I had an extreme fear of the dark. While laying in bed, I would always cover my mirror or I'd face the opposite side of the room that my mirror was on. I'd also make sure that I didn't stare at any dark corners of my room, along with my closet, which was very dark space that I couldn't help but face because it was on the opposite side of the room from my mirror. The next thing was that if I look in the mirror from my bed, I could see my closet. So one night, for some reason, I decided that I wanted to get over my fear of the dark. When I went to bed, I didn't cover up my mirror didn't put my head under the covers, nor did I face the opposite side of the room from my mirror. I laid down, turned my lamp off, and stared at my mirror. Then I guess I fell asleep. When I woke up, I was looking at my door. Then I panned my eyes over to my mirror. And to my surprise, there was someone standing in the darkness of my closet that I saw in the mirror. I fumbled to turn on my lamp, and I looked at my closet, but no one was there. I told my parents what happened. For some reason, they said it was my imagination. My 15-year-old imagination, I guess. I told them that I wasn't three years old and I know what I saw. A week later, I got up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom and I looked in the mirror, surprisingly seeing the same dark figure in my mirror. But he was closer to my bed. A lot closer. 
I ran screaming out of my room and told my parents again. I told them that there's no way that I will sleep in my room again. So my father said he was sleeping there starting the next night, in which I pleaded for him not to do it. Of course, he didn't listen and went anyway. The first few nights, there was nothing happening. My father didn't understand what scared me, but insisted that I never go in the room again. I go in there and grab anything that I needed. One night, my parents were placing more gifts under our Christmas tree while joking about the so-called monster in my room, as my father says. This whole time while he slept in my room, I slept in his with my mother, but I was on the floor. We all watched the movie and went to bed like usual. But my mother and I watched the Grinch movie, and that's when I guess I dozed off. My mother and I were startled hearing my father scream like that. We both ran into my room. My father was grabbing his left arm in the left side of his chest area. At the same time, he was pointing at the mirror with a startled look. My mother screamed for me to call 911, in which I ran to another room to call. When I came back, my mother was crying uncontrollably and my father wasn't moving anymore. His eyes were wide open in the direction of the mirror that stuck on him. My father passed away from a massive heart attack. After that night, my uncles and grandparents helped us move out because we didn't want to stay there anymore. My grandfather found a journal on the nightstand next to my bed. I never put it there. My mother looked at it and said it was my father's handwriting. What we didn't know was that my father kept a log for every night that he slept in my room. He mentioned that he saw someone in the mirror, and every night he would get closer to the point that the dark figure was standing over the bed. He just didn't tell anyone because he didn't want to scare us. I really don't know what to think honestly. Is this my fault that he's dead? I know our Christmas that year is not joyful as we wanted it to be. One, like this? I'm currently living together with my best friend. One day, while we were sleeping, she suddenly screamed and jumped up from the bed. I asked what happened and she explained what she had just experienced. So she got a sudden sleep paralysis when she was sleeping. She couldn't move her body at all. Moaning, she called my name desperately and said, Help me, I think I got sleep paralysis Give me a hug if you can hear my voice. Just then, someone started to press on her chest with an unbelievable, tremendous force. And she replied with my voice to be exact. Like this? Like this? And my voice sounded like frantically, she said. Two, the ticking sound. One day in the middle of the late night, I woke up to the sudden sound of the clock ticking. And what I realized right after I opened my eyes was that there was no clock at all in my room. As soon as I recognized the fact, the ticking sound coming from my room suddenly began to be heard, like an offbeat. You know the ghost could make the sound of ticking. 3. The computer in the motel room Because of my work, I had to stay at a motel one night. While I was sleeping for a long time, I suddenly saw the computer turning on automatically around 4 a.m. On top of everything else, internet broadcasting suddenly started. I thought something was weird, but I was so tired that I was almost going back to sleep. Then I heard the sudden voices of two men on the computer. Wow, 22 people are watching now. Terrified, I immediately turned off the computer right away. Four. The coincidence. I experienced this myself once before. While I was sleeping, I had a dream of someone pulling me roughly. Surprised, I swung at someone that pulled me in my dream with my fist and then woke up. And when I opened my eyes, I was hanging on the balcony railing and my mother was pulling me desperately. Her nose was bleeding and I realized that it was my mom who pulled me in my dream at that moment to save my life. What was more surprising was that one of the female students jumped to her death from our apartment at that daybreak. In late 2008, I came one night to find my mom sitting in the kitchen all alone and in floods of tears. 
When I asked her what was wrong, her answer made my jaw drop. My dad had left her. There was absolutely no indication that anything was wrong with their marriage or that he was remotely unhappy. But that afternoon, while I was out, he had apparently packed a few things into a suitcase, told her he was leaving, and just disappeared. I only mention this because it explains why my mum and little sister just didn't want to be in the house over Christmas and New Year. That kind of family-oriented time of year would have just been way too hard on them, so they basically buggered off to Mexico for a month to just decompress or whatever. Point being, I was all alone for Christmas and New Year's. Christmas Day sucked, and I realized that they were seriously right about not wanting to be alone in the house at that time of year. So for New Year's Eve, I decided to throw a little get-together for me and a load of my mates, hoping that a little party might take away some of the sadness I felt as a result of my dad leaving us. So on the night itself, it ends up being about 20 to 30 of us getting together in my parents' place, getting drunk, listening to music, playing Xbox, just a big hangout among some of the people I was closest to. It was a really good night to start off with, and it really did help take my mind off of things for a little while. We did the whole New Year's countdown thing, set off a few fireworks, generally having a brilliant little night together. But the drunker we all got, the messier things became, until it was just a medley of people throwing up, hooking up in the spare bedroom, or arguing amongst themselves. Two of the people who ended up fighting were my mate Chris and his girlfriend at the time, a girl named Katie. And what I could gather, Katie thought Chris had been flirting with a mutual friend of ours and had taken issue with it. Chris was insisting that they were just being friendly and it was nothing to worry about, but Katie was adamant that something was going on, that he was cheating on her, blah blah blah. You know how it is, teenage drama. Now I know Chris really did love her, so it wasn't like a stand-up argument, it was more like him begging her to see reason and to not go mad and dump him over some perceived bit of flirting. He swore he'd never do anything like that, that she was the only girl for him, how much he loved her, all this romantic, theatrical stuff that he might expect from two young lovers. It wasn't really anything of my business though, so me and the other party guests just sort of left them to it while we got on with trying to have fun. Then a little while later, I find Chris sitting in the back garden, swigging off a bottle of raw vodka on his own. I go up to him to ask him if he's okay, only to find that he's crying, rotten drunk, saying that Katie had dumped him and gone home. I tried to be a good friend and console him as best I could, saying that she probably was just drunk and over-emotional, how there was a good chance that they'd just get back together over the next couple of days when she'd realize she'd made a mistake. But he was insistent. She was gone for good, and they wouldn't be getting back together. All I could do was get him on his feet and hug it out with him. The poor guy really was in one heck of a state, and I managed to convince him to hand over the vodka, drink some water, and then get some sleep in my bed so he could maybe sober up a wee bit before heading on home. He agrees. I tuck him in and then leave him to get some rest. About an hour or so later, the party is winding down and the remainder of us are just chilling in the TV room when someone goes off to use the toilet. They return like seconds later, saying someone's in the bathroom throwing up, then asking if they can go and take a pee in the back garden. Of course, I tell them no. I didn't want them peeing all over my mum's flower beds and that I'll nip upstairs to see if I can get whoever is out of the bathroom. So I get the toilet upstairs and... I can hear someone gagging and retching on the other side of the locked door. My friend Julia joins me, a wee bit concerned, and starts trying to help me talk to the person who's locked themselves in the bathroom. It's sometime then that I notice that two doors are open, the first being my bedroom, the second being a little cupboard on the first floor landing. I check my bedroom and see that the bed is empty, so it's obviously Chris that's in the bathroom, puking his guts up because of all the vodka he drank. I shut the door to the bedroom, then go to close the door on the other room which happened to be a little cover that my mom kept cleaning supplies in. My first thought was that Chris had opened up that door thinking it was the bathroom in his drunken haze, then legged it to the right bathroom in his desperation to puke. But I noticed something that, at first, I didn't really understand the significance of. The cleaning supplies that my mom usually kept all neat in a little plastic box were spilled all over the floor. Not like open fluids spilling out, 
They were just all out of the box like someone had been rooting through them. As I'm wondering why someone would do something like that, Julia calls out that the person who'd locked themselves in the bathroom, presumably Chris, had gone quiet all of a sudden and that they weren't responding. That's when I put two and two together. Violent vomiting, cleaning supplies missing, deep drunken depression. Chris was trying to end his own life. I absolutely pegged it to the bathroom door and started trying to kick the door off the hinges. Julia screams in shock at what I'm doing and people from the living room start piling out towards the bottom of the stairs in utter confusion. I've been really protective of the house all night, not wanting people smoking inside, not wanting people peeing anywhere they shouldn't, trying to stop spillages and all of that kind of stuff. Then there I was, booting down my own bathroom door. It was way too heavy to actually kick off the hinges, but I did manage to kick a hole in the wood paneling, and that's when I got a look inside. Chris was laying there, a bottle of bleach next to him, and there was like pink puke all over the cistern, the floors, and his clothes. It was pink because he drank the bleach and it had corroded or burned the inside of him so much that he had vomited up blood. We were distraught, terrified, almost sure that he was dead but we were quick to call an ambulance. Chris had his stomach pumped and he survived, but it took a long time for him to be back to normal. Because he puked, the fumes had damaged his lungs or something. I'm not a doctor, so don't have a go if I get the details wrong. So he had trouble eating, drinking, and breathing for at least a month after that. Twelve years later, and I've never forgotten that, and I'm pretty sure neither has he. Because as far as I know, Chris never drank vodka again, because of the smell of it makes me think of that night. God knows what horrible memories it brings back to him. Before the story, just a little background information. I'm a 15-year-old guy living in northern Florida with my mom and my dog. We live in a two-story apartment located in a small apartment complex that just happens to be right next to an old cemetery. Just to be clear, I get out of school at 3 o'clock and my mom doesn't get off work until 5, so it's typical of her to take a late lunch and pick me up. Then go back to work for another hour and a half and get home around 5.30. Anyways, on with the story. So it was around three months after we moved into our condo when this occurred. It was a typical Friday for me, go to school, get home at 3.15, and be home alone until my mom got there. On this particular day, my mom decided to stay late and wouldn't get home until 8 o'clock. I, like most other teenagers, didn't mind being home alone for extended periods of time, simply because I got to play video games without any interruption. It's around 6.15, my dog was whining, so I decided to take him for a walk. As I walked downstairs, I heard what sounded like someone breathing outside my front door. Not just light breathing. I mean, it sounded like someone had finished running a marathon or something. I turned to investigate, and to my horror, I saw a tall, shirtless man standing with his face pressed directly against the glass. This man had to be at least six foot seven in his mid fifties and had a lumberjack style beard with very large glasses. My kitchen is right next to my front door so I grabbed the biggest knife I could and told him to fuck off. He seemed emotionless and simply walked away. I wish the story ended there, but of course, it didn't. It was now around 7.30, so it was getting dark, and there was no signs of the creepy man, so I decided it was safe to proceed outside. So me and my dog walked our usual path, which led us directly past the cemetery. This time, it was different. I had this eerie feeling that I wasn't alone. I could feel someone watching me. My dog's ears perked up and eventually stopped walking altogether. 
he began to stare towards the cemetery and started barking uncontrollably. I started looking to see what he was barking at, and to my absolute shock, I saw the same bearded guy from before. He looked different though, almost like he was leaning on something, but I couldn't quite see what it was. As I leaned in to take a closer look, I realized that it was a shovel, and he had a red bag on the ground next to him with what looked like a human foot sticking out of the bottom of it. Was this creep digging a fucking grave? Was this creep digging a fucking grave? I asked myself. What happened next still sends chills down my spine. He gave me the creepiest smile I've ever seen. Then he simply picked up his shovel and once again began digging as if he never saw me. Safe to say, me and my dog got the hell out of there. When I got back home, my mom was already there and I told her what happened. She called the cops and I guess they went to the cemetery to investigate but found nothing. We moved out of that place a few months later. Six months have now passed and I still haven't heard anything from the police. I just hope he's either dead or in jail somewhere. So sick fuck in the cemetery? Let's never meet again. My name is Alex, and this incident that I will never forget happened in 2019. It was about exactly 10 p.m., and I was still miles away from my house. I couldn't drive yet due to my young age, so I was walking home by myself. I used to be afraid of strangers and the dark, so the anxiety was getting worse. I was walking down the street, pulling out my cell phone flashlight since it was pitch black outside. Nobody was on the road, and I felt that was very weird because the street usually had lots of people around there. Let's just get back as soon as possible. I was nervous, but didn't have any choice. After about an hour of walking, I heard a sudden piercing scream of a young girl. What was that? I froze in place and my heart was beating intensely. After about 30 seconds, I heard it again, but it was different. It sounded like someone was being killed this time. I started to run in the direction of the screaming. However, it suddenly stopped as soon as I arrived at the place. I was terrified at this point. Just then, I heard light footsteps. I shined my flashlight on and to my surprise, there was a little girl crying with a bunch of stab wounds. The wounds looked serious, and she should have died already because of that, but she was alive. I asked what happened, and she told me that she was kidnapped by a guy at the Walmart when she was going to buy a drink. They covered my face and mouth, and I passed out. She then said that she was in a van with three men inside. There's some other stuff I will not explain in this story because I think it's beyond normal crimes, and she doesn't want others to know what happened. So anyway, I couldn't leave her just like that, so I carried her on my back. And she was light, like a feather, as if she hadn't eaten in weeks. I eventually took her to my house, and my parents made some food for her. And it was kind of scared to see her pale face and skinny body. Then I called the police, and they went to the area where I found the girl. After a few hours, they reported to me that they had found an old cabin, and the parents' dead body of the young girl inside and their bodies were brutally dismembered. After that, they had found a man with a knife hiding in the cabin. The girl was still eating, looking at me with a confused look, and I felt really sorry for her at that time. The criminal was arrested on the spot and eventually sent to jail for life in prison on a charge of murder. The case seemed to end like that, but we left a girl. She had nowhere to go back. I told my parents, and after having lots of conversation, they eventually decided to adopt her. Now I'm 17 years old and she's turned eight years old and we have such a good brother and sister relationship. However, to this day, I've always wondered what would have happened to her that day if I didn't go and search for where the scream had come from.
Got a call at about 4 a.m. Typical car wreck in rural area. Respond and find car hit light pole and no one around. Figure it's a drunk and start walking around the area trying to find where he's hiding. One house in the area across the street and about 150 yards away. After a couple of minutes, a woman comes screaming bloody murder from the house towards my unit. Full sprint, screaming at the top of her lungs. I shine my flashlight on her so she knows where I am because she's just running towards my car. She sees me and runs straight up to me. I'm trying to calm her down, make sure she's not injured and all that good stuff. She tells me it's her car. Okay, getting somewhere, but she wasn't driving. Here we go. Let me guess, somebody stole it? Nope. She told her husband she was leaving him. He freaks out and says he's going to kill himself. She says he downed a bottle of aspirin and no clue if this was true or not. When that didn't work, he jumped in the car and drove into the light pole trying to kill himself. When that didn't work, he ran back over to the house and they argued some more. Sees me pull up, makes her leave and locks all the doors. I asked her why she didn't leave and was he being violent towards her. No, he would never hurt her, she said. But he grabbed like a 12 inch butcher knife from the kitchen and told her she needed to go, so she did. Once he locked the door, she panicked because the children were inside. Don't remember the ages, but very young. Cue the screaming and running. I look over to the house and began to see the interior lights going off one by one. Well shit. I hurry up and jump in my car and drive over. Fellow cop pulls up. Quickly fill him in. Armed suicidal male with kids inside. House is dead quiet. We begin stalking around in the darkness trying to peek in windows to assess the situation. As we get to the back door we hear a noise and my buddy swings his light up and we see him in the backyard behind us. Freaking guy was outside the entire time watching us. He's sitting on his feet half sitting up is the best way I can describe it. Tats all over him, no shirt on with jeans. His head is cocked to the side and he's just staring at us with that giant ass knife in his hand and not saying a word. We both draw but keep our guns by our sides. He's about 20 feet away. Start talking to him but no response. Then all of a sudden without saying a word he begins cutting. I mean full on slicing his forearms and chest. Then he begins screaming and crying. We're telling him to stop, just talk to us, you're not in trouble, we'll get you help. He says he deserves to die. Well, I'm not killing him and my buddy's not either. He switched hands and started slicing the other forearm. Just deep terrible cuts and he won't stop. He starts slicing his thighs, chest, and even his neck a little. We already called for the ambulance. He finally stood up and was begging for us to kill him. We kind of danced around a little while not allowing him to position himself to become a threat to us. Yes, I know about the reactionary gap and I wasn't worried about it. He was losing blood and getting weak, so we basically decided to wait him out. He cut a few more times and he walked around a bit and then just fell down. We pounced and got the knife away and the ambulance showed up. Got him to ER. Docs advised it took 250 stitches to patch him up. No charges and we got him referred for some help. The kids were unharmed by the way. He sent her away because he wanted to die and didn't want her to see it. No shit, I pulled that guy over about three months later on a random traffic stop. And when he saw me, he just burst into tears and gave me a big old hug. Wife and kids were in the car and they were making it one day at a time. Said he got some help and was in a dark place that night. Ever been thanked for not shooting someone? Yep, it's just as weird as it sounds. I'm 30 years old. My family moved to the United States when I turned 14. I grew up in Russia, in a town called Kirov. It was big enough to house a full spread of criminal activity, from organized crime to cannibalistic hobos. These few stories are not tied together with anything else other than a cultural connection, and hopefully will give you a small glimpse of the state of Russia during the 90s, right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. 
When I was very little, we lived in a typical Russian five-story apartment building in what was considered to be a middle-class neighborhood. It was fairly quiet, with nothing much happening. So us kids could play outside for as long as we wanted to, without adult supervision. I remember a man who lived on the first floor of our building. He was probably in his mid to late thirties, always wearing a dirty wife beater, never a clean shave. Every time it seemed, when I would walk or ride my bike past his window, he would jump up from his chair and begin to yell and shout as loud as he could at me, swearing, calling me all kinds of names and threatening me. He would always do this with excessive violent movements and facial expressions. As a four-year-old boy, I would just stand there in horror, watching him do this crazy murderous rampage. He would fall on his elbows on the windowsill and shake his head feverishly, spitting out curses and death threats at me with his eyes bulging. He would punch his chest with all of his strength and was almost in tears from his psychotic rage. He would announce his hatred towards me and how much he wanted me dead. I just remember being shocked and would just stand there and let the horror overtake me, leaving the crazy man just staring at me out of his window. One day, the man disappeared. No more insane harassment at the window. Being a kid, I just moved on with my life and didn't think about it for years until much later I told my parents about him and what he would do to me as a kid. The story that they told me confirmed my suspicions about him. Around one of the last times I ever saw him, a strange occurrence happened in our city. Body parts were found scattered throughout our city, all far from each other. They all belonged to one unfortunate man, whose wife plotted to kill him for the sake of acquiring his apartment and belongings. The woman's brother happened to be the freak living downstairs who apparently killed the husband and dismembered his body in a tub and discarded the pieces throughout the city, including the head. Everything led to the wife, and it didn't take her long to blame the entire thing on her dear brother, who to this day is sleeping in some dark cell, far away in the cold. When I was a young kid, we had moved to another house once. One afternoon during the weekend, my dad asked me to go to church with him. However, being a little kid at that time, I was tired of going to church, sitting inside and just praying like that. So I refused, and he soon gave up, and finally, I ended up staying home alone on the weekend. I suddenly felt thirsty while I was enjoying my alone time watching TV. It was about 2 p.m., and I woke up and headed for the kitchen. Then something strange next to the refrigerator caught my eye. It looked like a black silhouette, like a person with short hair and a long skirt. At that moment, I could feel my whole muscle got flinched and strained. Shoot, whatever. Uh, I'm not here to drink water. I'm just here to get some tissue. Being scared, I gave up getting some water out of the refrigerator and then went straight to the bathroom. I grabbed the toilet paper and began cleaning the place around the TV for no reason. I was really terrified at that time though. I kept trying not to look at it, but then I realized something more frightening. The head of the silhouette was moving in the same direction that I was moving. Like it was literally watching me. I couldn't stay here anymore, so I ran out of the house. As soon as the front door closed, I ran down to the playground sat there and waited for hours until my dad finally came back. After that day, I remember my dad started to chant the Buddhist scriptures all night long, floating a bowl of water on a small table. In the end, we eventually moved to another place. Me and my dad were talking about a ghost story when he started telling me something about the house we had lived in before. While we were living in the house, my dad started to dream very often. One day, he had a dream that a woman was cutting something in our kitchen. When he got closer, he noticed that she was cutting hair continuously. Another day, he heard the sound of chopping something damp, like meat. When he got closer, he saw my body was crumpled in the sink and only my face was on the cutting board. And she had taken my tongue out and was finally chopping it with a big knife. 
My dad was able to see her face for the first time in his dream. Her eyes were purely red, and she kept smiling at him with her mouth almost ripped, and she never stopped using the knife. He also said that the woman had short bobbed hair and was wearing a long skirt. I think it was the same day that I saw a woman's silhouette in the kitchen. Since then, Dad has visited the church, asking the pastor for help. He even visited the temple to get a recording tape of the Buddhist scripture from the chief priest and prayed all night, but it was all useless. So we eventually moved out again soon. And thankfully, my dad no longer had the dream anymore and I didn't see the shadow in our new house. I was only nine at the time, and we had just moved to a better location. Our apartment was on the sixth floor and was the last one on the landing. It was the furthest you could go from the entrance of the building and was fairly secluded. The staircase was also completely indoors with four apartments to a floor. One day, I came home from school around 2 p.m. My parents weren't due back for at least another three hours and I set about doing my usual homework, watching TV and emptying out the fridge. It was around the time that I settled down for an episode of Babylon 5 that I heard the front doorbell ring. And this was very odd as my parents both had their keys, and no one else usually visited around this time of day. I went over to the front door and asked, Who is it? I heard a man answer back. Hello there, I am from the electrical company. We are doing a routine check on the electrical meters. May I come in and inspect yours? It will only take a minute. I looked through the peephole, and saw a young man, probably nearing his thirties, very clean, neatly dressed, with his hair combed to the side. He held a clipboard in his hand, with some papers attached. I was about to twist open the lock, when something caught my eye. Because of the fisheye view I had on the landing, I could also see a little extra to the sides, on my left and the man's right. I saw a light bouncing from what looked like a sharp metal object. It took me a second, but I clearly saw what it was. It was the cutting edge of an axe. Someone was standing right next to the door, attempting to hide from view, holding an axe in their hands. At this point, my memory gets blurry. I remember stepping away from the door and creeping into my room, which was the furthest in the hallway. I closed my door and didn't come back out until my parents got back. The bell kept ringing for a few more minutes, and then it finally fell silent. I never told anyone about it, until now. So these were my stories, and I think there's always something important to learn from encounters like this. I grew up during the 1980s in a very tight-knit community in Georgia. When I was a kid, I used to love camping in my backyard. Almost every Friday night, me and my little brother Donnie would set up a tent in our backyard and spend the night playing with our G.I. Joes inside the tent. Our neighborhood was nice, but the surrounding area was a bit shady. You see, this was at the height of the crack cocaine epidemic. And within a few years, our small town became infested by addicts and drug dealers. I remember there was an old man named Mr. Carl who was once a pilot in World War II. He used to live across the street from us. His wife died of cancer around 1984, and after that, he went off the deep end. Three years after his wife's death, he became addicted to crack and began wandering the streets at night. It wasn't long after that when his house got repossessed by the bank, and Mr. Carl became homeless. Me and Donnie would see him almost every morning sleeping on a bench at our bus stop. Sometimes, he would be awake and would talk to us. We knew Mr. Carl. So we weren't afraid of him, and he never tried anything with us. He was always very friendly. After a while, Donnie and I noticed that Mr. Carl was no longer around. We asked our parents if they knew anything about what might have happened to him, but they didn't have a clue. I can't recall how much time went by since the disappearance of Mr. Carl, but I would say it was at least a month. 
So on one Friday night, me and my brother were in our backyard playing with these rubber band rifles our dad made for us. It was a piece of wood with a wooden clip glued to the top of it and a nail sticking out the front so you could stretch a rubber band around the nail and clip it to the top. That way when you release the clip, the rubber band went flying. Me and Donnie were shooting up plastic toy soldiers when we heard something rustling in the bushes outside. Now, this is Georgia. We've chased away our fair share of raccoons and stray dogs. And with our new makeshift weapons, we were feeling extra brave that night. We decided not to go get our dad, and that we would handle the intruder ourselves. So we both exited the tent, and made our way to the very back of the yard, where a chain-link fence separated our property from a small forest area. Donnie had brought along the flashlight, and was pointing it into the forest just beyond the fence. When we got to the fence line, a figure emerged from behind a tree. I recognized the jacket that the person was wearing. It was a dark brown bomber-style jacket, and I saw that the person was also wearing one of those army veteran caps. There's only one person I knew who wore a jacket like that. Mr. Carl. However, when I got a better look at the guy in the woods... It didn't really look like Mr. Carl. He was definitely wearing his clothing, but the man appeared to be way too young to be Mr. Carl. I couldn't get a good look at the man's face. He was looking down, so the bill of his cap concealed his features. That's when I noticed the dark red stains all over the man's jacket and jeans. Me and Donnie just stared at the man for about 30 seconds before asking him what he was doing back there. The man then reached down and grabbed a large axe that was lying at his feet. He then began coming towards the fence. Me and my brother dropped our wooden guns and took off back towards the house. As soon as I turned around, I felt something fly past my head. I looked to the side to see the axe flipping through the air. It crashed into the tent, causing it to collapse. The rest of that night is a blur to me. According to our dad, when me and Don burst into the house, we were absolutely hysterical. It took about an hour to get the full story out of us, and by that time, the mysterious man in Mr. Carl's jacket was gone. I just remember my parents talking to a police officer in the living room later that night. As far as I'm aware, there was never any follow-up, and I don't know if they ever caught the guy or retrieved the axe he threw into our backyard. This incident effectively put an end to our Friday night camping, and we never figured out what exactly happened to Mr. Carl. Okay, so this event only occurred really recently, and I still can't believe it happened. I live in Sydney, Australia, and I'm very used to the occasional insane or creepy person on the street or bus, etc. I know how to deal with them and act around them most of the time. A few weeks ago, I decided to go shopping at a big shopping center known as Westfields in Australia. I'm not sure where they're called elsewhere. They are always busy, and it's hard to find parking, but I managed to get a great spot in the parking lot, on the level where you can enter the center. I shopped and everything was good. I had some lunch, bought some groceries and a new dress. I exited the shopping center and started walking towards my car. There wasn't anybody in the parking lot except for a few cars trying to find a spot. Nothing out of the ordinary. Then I noticed a lady walking in the other lane next to mine. She had tangled, matted, and thinning hair. She wasn't dressed in the nicest or newest clothes. She was talking to herself, but I didn't think much of it because people do that when they're trying to remember something or going over something in their head. Then she starts screaming. Nothing in particular, just gibberish. I look over to see what she's doing or if she's injured, but nope, she's fine, just staring directly at me and screaming. She locks eyes with mine as soon as I turn to see what she was yelling about. 
A few seconds pass and nothing happens. She keeps screaming while keeping direct eye contact with me. Then her mouth spreads into an insanely terrifying grin. She stops screaming and starts bolting towards me. I was frozen for what seemed like an eternity, but it was probably only three seconds. I hightailed it to my car, chucked my shopping bag in the seat next to mine, cracked all my eggs, and slammed the door shut just in time. This lady starts banging on my car, screaming while trying to open the doors. I quickly back out of my spot, not caring if I knock this batshit crazy lunatic to the ground. I didn't, she was fine, physically, but at this point she climbs onto my fucking trunk and tries to break my back window. I start to move the car and she jumps off but chases after me for a few levels and then I lost her. My heart was beating so fast I thought I was going into cardiac arrest. I called the police and told them where I saw her and what she did. They didn't find her at the shopping center and I haven't heard anything else about this, but my boyfriend offered to get me a new carton of eggs. My mom is quite a tough person. Her first impression, her way of speaking, and even her personality were so tough that she was often told that she would have succeeded if she becomes a shaman whenever she went to see a fortune teller. I guess that's why my mom has seen ghosts since she was very young. Sometimes she always told me this whenever we went driving to go somewhere. You know there are many ghosts around in this town. According to her, there's a rule in areas with a lot of ghosts. She said that they exist usually in areas with large bodies of water, like rivers or lakes. Because those places had strong yin energy, the ghosts have nothing to do but just stay there. One day, Mom suddenly started screaming as we were driving along the road next to the river. Then she said that this place was full of ghosts. When I asked which place it was, she pointed her finger at one specific area near the water and replied, Right there. My heart dropped at that very moment. After we passed that area, she kept looking back and saying that it was strange. And something more horrifying happened after that. A few days later, we heard that an unidentified body was found by the river while watching the news. And the place was where we had passed by that day, and it was exactly the same place that my mom pointed her finger. When I asked my mom making a fuss, she then answered as if nothing had happened. Oh well, so that's why. They were gathered to see that body. I ended up staying up all night that day because I kept thinking about the scene my mom told me about. So right when I had just finished college, I was living in a one-bedroom townhouse slash split. I met a guy on Plenty of Fish and at the time, I wasn't exactly smart about my online digital footprint. It's not like I've really changed, but at least now I'm not as ridiculous as I was. Anyways, he seemed like a really decent guy. He was really good looking, he said he had a good job, nice teeth, and he looked like he really cared about his personal health. Pretty much all the things that I would typically look for in a guy. I'm not a shallow human, but I really like to be presentable. And if I'm with someone, I would like them to care about being presentable in a business environment also. After about a week of chatting online, we agreed to meet. We had met at a restaurant that was downtown, which was really far from where I lived. Right when I got there, I had noticed him standing at the door. We sat down to eat, and the evening went really great. At the end of the day, we said bye, and I got into my car and began to drive away. I realized right away that he was following me. Because of the distance to my house, I wasn't immediately scared because it's a really big city. Maybe he'll turn off the freeway or something, but he didn't. My exit was coming up and I decided not to take it. I just kept driving. I circled the entire city on the freeway and he stayed right behind me the whole time. I was really starting to panic a bit, so I decided to go to my friend's house instead of mine. And when I pulled out of the exit, I noticed that he didn't. 
so I had a little bit of a moment to breathe and I just decided, okay, screw it, I'll just go home. I took the off-ramp back onto the freeway and began going back to my exit. I got home and showered and was getting ready for bed. I started feeling really dumb and I started thinking things like, was that really him? Am I overreacting? Maybe I should ask him if he was following me. Pretty much just a number of things racing through my overactive imagination. Or so I thought. I decided I was going to message him and just say, Hey, I had a good time tonight. Good night. And right when I started typing, all of a sudden a message came through to my phone of a picture of my car right outside my house. I nearly died upon seeing that. My heart jumped out of my chest and I started shaking. I didn't know what to say and he then texts me and says, I didn't know you lived across the street from me. Now, I've met my neighbors before, and not once have I ever met him. There's a huge apartment complex kitty corner to my townhouse, so maybe that's where he lived. I don't know. I popped up and I went to go look outside, and there he was, just standing there outside like he was waiting for me. I opened the door and he asked if he could come in and if I still wanted to hang out. I told him I was really exhausted as I'd rather just crash out as it had really been a long day. The very next morning I woke up to go to work and my windshield had been smashed, my car was keyed and my bag two tires were completely slashed. As I was noticing the damage to my vehicle, the guy comes out of his car with two coffees and is like, Oh I thought I'd surprise you with a morning coffee. So again I'm totally freaked out. I called the cops and I reported the damage to my vehicle. The guy offered to drive me, but something in my gut was just telling me not to get in his car. So I called my boss and I told him about the situation and I explained that I wasn't going to be there until after the police came. This guy just hung out the entire time, by the way. When the police finally got there, this guy was acting really suspicious. He walked away and he started hiding on the other side of his car. I filed the report and the police basically just told me that they hope I have insurance right as they were on their way to leave. They pulled around the corner and all I heard was the siren and then the cop car's lights turn on and then the cop screamed. Freeze! Put your hands in the air and get down on your knees! I turned to look and the cop has his gun drawn on this guy and the dude's on the ground getting arrested. I spoke with the cop after he got into the back of the car and he explained that he was wanted for stalking, breach of probation, assault with a deadly weapon, fraud as well as aggravated assault. I was absolutely shook. It took me a couple of days to get over the hypothetical situations that could have happened to me. About a week later, I was on my way out the door to work and guess who was sitting right in my driveway. We live in Canada so essentially you're released on conditions until you go to jail. I told him that I was late for work, but that I'd call him when I was done working. I never went to work that day. I went and found a new apartment in another area of the city. I changed my phone number, and I hired my friend's husband and his friends to go pack my apartment up and move it to their place for about a month, and then move it to my new place because I was just so scared this dude would follow them while moving. So yeah, that's my scary story about the first time I used plenty of fish, and I'm never using it again.